Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 69, The Munich Agreement Part 1, Background. This week, a big thank you goes out to Julie and Scott for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special members-only episodes released once a month. Head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. The Munich Agreement, where four European nations came together to preserve peace at a time when war seemed to be slipping ever closer. The Munich Betrayal, where four European nations came together to destroy another, not through military force, but by diplomatic proclamation. A foolish attempt to negotiate and placate a German dictator who was insatiable in his lust for expansion. A pragmatic negotiation that recognized the weakness of Germany's enemies and bought additional time for rearmament. A deft application of foreign policy to protect the peace in Europe that had lasted for 20 years. All of these and many more have been applied to what is most likely the most controversial single moment of the interwar years. On September 30, 1938, representatives from France, Britain, Germany, and Italy would sign the Munich Agreement. It would be the outcome of a lengthy series of discussions that had occurred over the spring and summer of that year. The primary outcome would be the second expansion of German territory in less than a year, with Czechoslovakia forced to cede certain territories to German control. The path to September 30th was a long one, and it will take us several episodes to get to that point. Today we're going to start by laying some groundwork with discussion of a few important pieces of the Munich saga, the formation of Czechoslovakia, the Sudeten Germans, and British views on appeasement. Each of these three pieces would play an important role over the course of the events that would eventually result in the Munich Agreement. Like many other nations in Eastern Europe at this time, Czechoslovakia had been created in the aftermath of the First World War. The areas that would make up Czechoslovakia had previously been a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the two primary ethnic groups in the area, and the two that would drive the creation of the new nation were the Czechs and the Slovaks. But there were many other groups that would be included within its borders. One of the major challenges involved in the creation of not just Czechoslovakia, but other nations like, like Poland and Yugoslavia, was exactly where the borders of these new nations should be. It started with the assumption that the Czechs and Slovaks wanted to include as many Czechs and Slovaks as possible, and this meant that certain pieces of territory had to be included, the areas that were almost entirely made up of people of those ethnicities. But as the conversations moved away from these sort of core areas, things became more challenging. The easy answer that would be given at the Paris Peace Conference was that these questions should be handled by the people who lived in the various areas, a simple plebiscite to determine which nation to join. But this was not some sort of magic bullet when it came to resolving these problems, because it meant that an area could be given to one nation or the other based on the slimmest of majorities. At a generic level, this may seem acceptable, but in reality, there were many cases where it simply could not be applied. There were local and regional rivalries that sometimes dated back centuries, there were economic and defense considerations, and there was simply the matter of who controlled what. In the chaos uh, as the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, several of the successor nations took matters into their own hands and they grabbed as much territory as they could control. When it came time to certify this territory, those in Paris often found their ability to make drastic changes somewhat limited, and instead they had to just make do with small shifts in borders instead of drastic revision. For Czechoslovakia, all of this meant that there were both the core territories that contained a large majority of Czechs and Slovaks, and then there was a host of border territories where other ethnic groups were the majority. In the western half of the nation, this ethnic group was the Sudeten Germans. In the east, it was often Ukrainians. In the south, it was Hungarians. And there were also smaller areas that contained other groups as well, like a small Polish area in, in the north, which would play an important role later in 1939. This multi-ethnic makeup of the nation, especially in those border territories, would be critical to later events. But they were included in the nation for a variety of uh, pretty good reasons. In many areas, there were large Czech and Slovak populations, even if they were the minority. In others, there were historical claims that dated back centuries. In the West, and in the most important part for this series of episodes, the reason that so much territory was included was based around historic claims and then also giving the government in Prague the ability to defend itself. 
The terrain in the region was great for defense, and the new nation would take full advantage of this when preparing for a future possible conflict with Germany. Overall, Czechoslovakia was one of the big winners of Eastern Europe in this shuffle, as they had taken control of what had been very valuable Austro-Hungarian territory. The new nation included 75-ish percent of all industry of the former empire and was instantly the 10th largest economy in the world. Almost 20 years later, the nation was much the same, which was somewhat remarkable given the events in other nations that surrounded it. Most surprisingly, Czechoslovakia was still a democracy, which is unique because many of the other nations around it had shifted into some form of authoritarianism or military dictatorship. Political stability was a growing problem, though. The Czechs, who made up the majority of the population, were quite happy, but many of the minority ethnicities, including the Germans, Hungarians, and even the Slovaks, were becoming less than thrilled with the arrangements inside the nation. The growing agitation was particularly powerful in regions where neighboring countries existed that matched those ethnicities, so the Hungarians in Hungary, the Germans in Germany, and the Poles in Poland. One of those ethnic minorities were the Germans that lived in the Sudetenland, an area that occupied the far western areas of Czechoslovakia and kind of wrapped around the country from the north to the south. Before the First World War, this area had been a very prosperous one, and within the empire, the Sudeten Germans had enjoyed a lot of influence. Even after the war, relations between the Sudeten Germans and the Czech government did not immediately sour. The Sudetenland was a heavily industrialized area, and in the years of economic recovery during the 1920s, things went relatively well. But then the Great Depression happened, and it hit the Sudetenland very hard. Industry in the area declined at a far faster rate than elsewhere in the country, mostly due to the fact that the industries that had been very heavily represented in the Sudetenland were consumer industries, which were the hardest hit by the economic decline. By 1933, unemployment was over 25%, and almost two-thirds of all unemployed people in Czechoslovakia were ethnic Germans. In the years after 1933, economic hardship continued, and there were social welfare programs available, but just like in any other nation at this time, they were totally overwhelmed by events, resulting in the help that could be provided, still leaving the recipients in poverty. This hardship led to discontent, and for the Sudeten Germans, this discontent was exacerbated by the fact that they lived sometimes just miles away from Germany, where Hitler had taken power in 1933, and then it would appear that the German economy was beginning to revive far faster than that of Czechoslovakia. And the difference between the two economies would then accelerate as Germany entered serious rearmament in the mid-1930s. These feelings would be one of the reasons that the Sudeten Deutsch Party, or the Sudeten German Party, would be founded in 1933 under the leadership of Konrad Hinlein. The party would tap into a common feeling among Sudeten Germans that they were being repressed by the government. And to just clearly address this up front, it was mostly untrue. And while the Sudeten Germans were clearly a minority in Czechoslovakia, they were not oppressed in any meaningful way, and they would be treated as good as any other group in Eastern Europe. However, the persecution complex was a way for the Sudeten German party to gain power, and it did so very quickly. Another great boost to party support came from Germany, where money was given to the Sudeten German party on a monthly basis, in the form of 15,000 Reichsmarks per month. And then for major elections, like the election in 1935, they were given an additional lump sum of 330,000 Reichsmarks. This helped the party to seem far more popular and prosperous than it actually was. For the elections, Hinlein took the approach of abstaining from being a candidate himself, instead taking notes from Hitler's leadership of the Nazi party before 1933, and just focusing on being the party leader and being sort of above party politics. Another similarity was the personal oath of loyalty that Hinlein had all Sudeten German party members take who were elected to the government, and they had to swear that oath of loyalty before they could take up their positions in the government. Over the years, Hinlein would visit Germany and have personal meetings with Hitler several times. All of these meetings were around coordinating strategy, with Hitler providing Hinlein with directions and Hinlein expected to follow them. As Hinlein himself would later summarize, the general thrust of these orders was, quote, We must always demand so much that we can never be satisfied. In 1936, the first set of these demands would be made on the government in Prague. The demands were for greater territorial autonomy, 
the right of Sudeten Germans to consider themselves part of Germany, and then a new round of elections. These were the baseline, and over the next two years, they would only escalate. While Hinlein was making these demands back in Germany, Hitler was already planning for large changes in the region. By June 1937, the German military was hard at work on Case Green, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, and Hitler was looking for a full takeover of all of its territory. But the role of the Sudeten German party was still critical in the short term because it would help destabilize the critical border regions. When the Anschluss occurred, tensions in Czechoslovakia almost instantly escalated. The German absorption of Austria had introduced a long new shared border to Czechoslovakia's south, and this made the western region of the nation even more conspicuously placed within Germany. This made the threat of invasion even more severe, just from the fact that it could also be launched from another direction. Meanwhile, Hinlein and his party were also in the process of escalating. In March 1938, Hinlein was told to move his demands again, and this time so much that they would be completely unacceptable to Prague. This message was delivered to Hinlein in Berlin, where he met with Hitler, Ribbentrop, and Rudolf Hess. Along with the simple idea of escalations, the new demands were formulated to be more broad and open to interpretation. This would allow Hinlein to constantly shift their meaning and ensure that they were never really satisfied. These would be presented to the Prague government on April 24, 1938, at what would be no- and it would be known as the Carlsbad Program. One of the demands was simply full autonomy for the Sudetenland region. And while the government in Prague would entertain discussions about greater minority rights, full autonomy was simply off the table. What the Czechoslovakian government was willing to agree to represented real and meaningful compromises, but Hinlein took a hard line, and any compromises were seen as simply unacceptable. By September 1938, during which most of the following episodes will take place, the situation was basically out of control. On September 13th, the government would declare martial law in several areas of the Sudetenland after the Sudeten German party shifted loudly and publicly for agitating to join Germany. The party was then for a period of time outlawed before this was reversed under the pressure from the Western nations. We will certainly be talking about the Sudeten German party a lot during the following episodes and in Konrad Hinlein as well, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background here. But I also want to mention that one of the major problems that the Sudeten German party placed on the government in Prague was not just their demands, but the problems that they caused elsewhere. If the Germans were given greater autonomy, then there was a whole list of other minorities that were going to want the same thing. If they were allowed to join Germany, then there was a similarly long list of border regions that would demand the same. The eventual outcome, at least what Prague feared the eventual outcome of that would be, was simply the destruction of Czechoslovakia as a nation. While events in Czechoslovakia were an important driver of events, the people in Czechoslovakia and their political leaders would play only a limited role in the discussions that led to the Munich Agreement. Instead, the agreement would be presented to them as an ultimatum after the agreements had already been made by the British, French, German, and Italian governments. An important part of those discussions was a very controversial term, appeasement. The appeasement movement would come under a lot of criticism at the time, but that criticism would be massively amplified by the fact that the war started less than a year after the greatest act of appeasement, the Munich Agreement, was signed. Criticism of appeasement exists on a spectrum. At its worst, critics of appeasement claim that it helped cause the war, while on the other end is the argument that those who believed in appeasement were just idiots. Further conversation on the outcomes of appeasements are are probably left until the end of this series, but it is a very well-covered topic, and you can still find books being published about it to this very day. The roots of the appeasement movement, especially in Britain, where it would find some of its strongest support, can be found in the peace movements of the 1920s and 30s. After the creation of the League of Nations, there were large groups in Britain and other nations that saw the League as the path to a world without war. This would force the British government to participate in disarmament conferences and other events, even if it was very unlikely that such events would result in a real outcome. Along with the powerful support for British Britain to kind of lead the drive for continued peace, there was also the simple fact that when it came to Eastern Europe, the British government believed in a general lack of involvement. It wanted to stay out of things. It's too reductive to say that they didn't care Uh, But given the tenuous economic and political relationships with many of these nations, events in the region were far less of a concern than several other areas around the globe. 
For many in the British government, the most important thing was that the Western powers, including Germany, were in agreement about what was happening in the region. The specifics of what that was were highly negotiable. Or, as British Foreign Secretary John Simon would say in 1934, quote, Our own policy is quite clear. We must keep out of trouble in Central Europe at all costs. July 20 years ago stands as an awful warning, end quote. Now that July 20 years ago, referencing the start of the First World War. If anything, the increased power of the Nazi party in Germany and then its shift towards expansionist rhetoric merely caused the British greater concern. Not that it should be resisted, but that the British were at a greater danger of being drawn into a European conflict. There was strong support for almost any kind of border revision in the area if it averted a wider war. It was not certain that such revision would also lead to a future war. And government after government of British leaders believed that revision might actually help avoid future conflict, and this policy would have effects far beyond just border revision. British-led alterations to the Versailles Agreements, caution in the face of remilitarization of the Rhineland, and other changes were all part of the idea that it was better to make small changes to the European landscape if it avoided conflict. In hindsight, we know that this policy will not work, and in fact, most of British actions over the year after Munich, involved the British political landscape trying to come to terms with that fact, but it was not destined to fail from the start. If anything, British efforts can at times be viewed as as a simple misunderstanding of how politics had changed over the previous decades. Nowhere was this better exemplified than the multiple conversations that would occur between Britain and Germany about colonies. Starting in the late 1920s, there was the basic assumption in London that the German government wanted to revise some of the changes made to colonies back in the Versailles Treaty. In that treaty, all German overseas possessions had been removed from its control and, and, you know, parceled out to several different countries. This always feels like a very sort of 1800s kind of view, at least to me, of how to handle European political disputes. Are there disagreements in Europe? Sure. Would a few hundred thousand square kilometers somewhere in Africa make everybody happy? Then let's do it. There, were some, there was some basis for this view, even at the time of the interwar period, at least before Hitler took power, and there were active discussions about providing Germany with a mandate, much like what the British and French had in the Middle East. These possibilities dried up after 1938, or, you know, even before 1938, when they were again presented to Hitler, who basically just dismissed them out of hand a huge blow to the British who were more than willing to give up our colonies to preserve peace. It should also be said that such beliefs and actions were also probably outdated when it came to the colonies themselves, or as Sir George Gator, permanent undersecretary at the Colonial Office, would say in 1943, quote, Out of fear of Germany, we were prepared to hand over large tracts of colonial empire to Germany without consulting the wishes of the inhabitants playing straight into the hands of those sections of the colonies that wished to throw off Downing Street control. End quote. Now, if appeasement is vilified as a concept, it is personified by British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain would occupy the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer after 1931 and would retain the office until May 1937. During that time, he would play an important role in the early stages of British rearmament before taking the position of Prime Minister. Chamberlain felt that his focus had to be on foreign policy, and especially after the resignation of Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden in February 1938, Chamberlain exerted great personal influence on foreign affairs. Now here's a quote from Adrian Phillips from his book uh, Fighting Churchill, Appeasing Hitler. Quote, Chamberlain's positive approach to policy was the hallmark of his diplomacy. He wanted to take the initiative at every turn, most famously in his decision to fly to see Hitler at the height of the Sudeten crisis. Often his initiatives rested on quite false analysis, quite often the dictators preempted him. But Chamberlain was determined that no opportunity for him to do good should be allowed to escape. This very personal and very proactive method of conducting foreign policy was not really how things were done at this time. And instead, things were often done slowly and consensus was built before people like prime ministers even got involved. Chamberlain had many strengths, but when it came to negotiations, especially with men like Hitler, he had one very important shortcoming that would come up again and again and again. He believed people when they said they would do something. 
we will discuss several meetings between Chamberlain and Hitler over the coming episodes, and in each of them, Chamberlain believed that he had built a relationship with the German dictator, and he could count on him to keep his word. The famous Peace for Our Time moment was based on a joint declaration between Hitler and Chamberlain that the two nations would never go to war, which was just words on paper. This optimistic assumption of words meaning things could not have meant a worse person to apply them to than Adolf Hitler. Hitler could be erratic, and at times totally unpredictable, but one of his most consistent behaviors for the entirety of the 1930s was to say whatever needed to be said to get to an agreement, and then change that agreement at the first opportunity. Chamberlain, in his search for peace, would fall into this trap of coming to an agreement time and time again, only for the terms to be changed at the next meeting, sometimes just an hour later. Even the most impactful of these agreements, the Munich Agreement that we will continue our discussion of for the next seven or eight episodes, would last for a grand total of 166 days before the full German invasion of what was left of Czechoslovakia would occur. Was it naivety, blind optimism, the complete inability to read personal interactions, some kind of hero complex? Who knows? Those are some of the questions that we will need to answer starting next episode. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me for next week's episode, which will be part two of our series on the music.